Hey everyone, so here's the thing about gaming laptops. NVIDIA's Pascal architecture has brought the full fat desktop GPU experience to mobile form factors, but if you fancy a GTX 1070 or GTX 1080, you'll require a larger, fatter machine that kicks out a fair bit of heat and a lot of noise. It's a trade that many are happy to make, bearing in mind the phenomenal performance, but what if we could get that power into a much smaller form factor? So this is the ASUS Zephyrus GX501, a 15-inch laptop just 17.9 millimeters deep that somehow manages to integrate an i7 and yes, a GTX 1080. Weight? Well, it's pretty light actually at 2.24 kilos and ASUS reckons it'll max out at around 40 decibels under load. For this amount of gaming power, those stats are unprecedented. I've got to say that this is a beautiful design with state-of-the-art build quality, including a brushed aluminium style lid and very high quality plastics elsewhere. The Schicklet keyboard is excellent with full RGB lighting while the trackpad is super precise. Ports are decent too, with power, HDMI 2.0, two USB 3.0s, and the headphone jack to the left, and Kensington Lock USB-C with Thunderbolt, and a further brace of USB 3.0s to the right. What you will notice as a bit odd is the complete lack of a palm rest, with the keyboard shunted up to the front of the machine, and the trackpad placed alongside to the right. The point here is that in order to get a top-end GPU into a small form factor, ASUS needs area for heat dissipation and as much of it as possible. In fact, even this amount of space isn't quite enough. When you open up the screen, the base of the laptop opens too, providing a six mil gap that allows heat to escape more easily. All of which brings us onto the star of the show, the Max-Q version of the GTX 1080. Well, let's be clear about what this actually is. It's a downclocked version of the full fat chip where Nvidia has judged the sweet spot in terms of power consumption and heat generation versus performance. The reference desktop 1080 can boost all the way to about 1800 megahertz or higher, while I noted that GPU clocks here are more in the 1350 to 1440 megahertz territory. So let's look at a 4K benchmark where we can rule out the lower power Core i7 processor here as a potential bottleneck and concentrate exclusively on GPU performance. This is the Hitman DX12 benchmark with everything ramped up to the max with the Max-Q 1080 compared to the desktop version and the 1070. Some documentation I've seen suggests that the Max-Q 1080 is about 5% faster than the standard GTX 1070, but by and large, ballpark 1070 performance is what I think you're likely to get from the Max-Q 1080. I mean, if you watch the benchmark play out in context here, it's actually quite eerie how close the two are, but your mileage does vary. Rise of the Tomb Raider, for example, shows a clear advantage for the Max-Q 1080 over the desktop 1070 here at 1080p, though its lead varies according to the scene. And that's pretty impressive, bearing in mind that the 6700K CPU at 4.6 gigahertz is much faster than the 7700HQ in the ASUS. But yeah, go into this with ballpark 1070 performance in mind and you won't be disappointed. Now, we talk about Ultra HD benchmarks, but strapping a 4K screen into a 15-inch notebook like this would be borderline insane. So ASUS takes a different approach and instead offers up a 120Hz IPS G-Sync panel. Okay, so I've got a few opinions on this one. Firstly, whether we're talking GTX 1070 or 1080 levels of power, there's a compelling argument here that this is simply too much GPU for a 1080p screen on many games. And that means that we bump into CPU as the limiting factor of performance. Case in point, and this is just one game from many I could choose from, Far Cry Primal from Ubisoft. Now certain sections of the benchmark reconfirm that a Max-Q 1080 is basically on par with a desktop 1070. However, other parts of the benchmark, the more detailed areas with more of an emphasis on CPU-dependent draw calls, well, the graph speaks for itself. There can be anything up to an 18 to 20 FPS differential in favor of the desktop 1070. Now, that's not the fault of the Max-Q 1080 as such. It's simply that on modern game engines, you need lots and lots of CPU horsepower to actually make the most of a 120 Hz panel. The end result? Well, 1080p basically isn't the ideal target for this GPU, and if you do hit CPU limits, you're leaving a fair amount of GPU power that you've paid for on the table. 
And then there's the fact that you have a 1080p panel to begin with. I mean, pixel density isn't exactly that bad on a screen of this size, but aliasing can be an issue in motion. From my perspective, I think downsampling from 1440p might be preferable here. It sorts out most of the aliasing issues, it looks great, and while frame rates will obviously be lower, they will be more consistent. And thankfully, Nvidia's DSR technology is well up to the task here and produces some great results. So let's return to Far Cry Primal. 1440p is at the bottom of the graph, as you would expect, but the readout is far more consistent, meaning no CPU bottlenecking. And let's be clear here, if you want to inch those frame rates higher, there's nothing to stop you tweaking settings. We are at ultra here after all, and the Max-Q 1080 is still in 60 frames per second territory, even with that big resolution bump. So, just how much CPU power do we actually have on tap here? Well, let's take a look at Intel's XTU and run the CPU stress test. The i7-7700HQ has a 3.8 GHz turbo, but its base clocks are limited to a paltry 2.8 GHz. The good news here is that the Zephyrus is delivering 3.4 GHz across all four cores and eight threads, which is remarkable for an i7 in this kind of form factor. But how fast is this in desktop gaming terms? Well, this is just one test, but Ashes of the Singularity's CPU benchmark shows the i7-7700HQ to be around 5% faster than an i5-7600K at stock speeds when paired with similar 2400MHz DDR4. Yeah, the 7700K, that's a ton faster, even at stock frequencies, but that's still a decent amount of gaming power at your fingertips, and there are titles that simply run better on an i7. But let's be clear here, there are going to be games where you will hit 120 hertz or close to it with this machine. Your general esports games won't cause this machine any problems whatsoever. Overwatch? Yeah, no problems at all. Auto settings actually does a great job here in locking me to 120 hertz and balances the settings nicely, even giving me a 140% resolution scale. Battlefield 1? Well, certainly with judicious tweaks to the settings. Hello, post-processing. I could run this game at over 100 frames per second, and G-Sync sorts out any unpleasantness from drop frames as we dip down to lows in the 100 frames per second area. 100 FPS, I mean, that's nice, right? Okay, so let's talk about battery performance. I mean, this is a mobile system after all. So here's the thing, the battery not only has a finite amount of juice, it can't deliver as much of it at any one time as the power supply. So performance takes a hit when you're not plugged in. Using GPU Mangler Assassin's Creed Unity as a benchmark, I reckon you get around 80% of performance while on the go, which actually isn't that bad at all. Though do be prepared for occasional stutter as CPU and GPU compete for that paired back level of power. However, that isn't the end of the story. Once battery life drops beneath 50% or thereabouts, GPU clocks drop and performance takes a nosedive, as you can see here where I've rebenched again. All things being equal, I reckon you get about 40 minutes of battery life in all, which obviously isn't ideal, demonstrating that regardless of technological advances, gaming laptops really are designed to be used plugged into the wall. Okay, so let's wrap this up. The ASUS Zephyrus is a pretty awesome package overall. I mean, it may not be offering full GTX 1080 power, but even ballpark 1070 performance in a shell as tiny as this, with a full quad-core i7 and with a 120Hz G-Sync screen, well, that's pretty awesome in my books. Now, there's plenty in this laptop that kind of helps to justify its price point. 24 gigs of RAM, a super-fast Samsung SSD, Beautiful build quality, the list goes on, but Max-Q in itself is a trade. Reduced power draw allows for this lovely form factor, but it also means that 1080 performance here is actually handing in 1070 frame rates. And that makes me wonder. Now physically, this is a fully enabled GP104 Pascal processor, just like the desktop 1080. But if it's only providing ballpark 1070 power, can we still really call it a 1080? And I'm not sure manufacturers can charge a premium for it as such. And as much as I love having this much gaming power in a little laptop, it's not all plain sailing. I mean, typing on this keyboard is fine, but the lack of a palm rest definitely makes it more challenging to use on the go. I mean, ASUS actually provides a palm rest in the packaging, and indeed a mouse actually, but that's not going to help that much when you're in transit. But as a statement of how far technology has progressed, man, this thing is supremely impressive. 
I mean, two years ago, Titan X Maxwell appeared, a 250 watt TDP GPU you'd have to install into a desktop PC. The ASUS here exceeds that level of GPU power, holds its own on CPU, it's blisteringly fast in general operation owing to its SSD and 24 gigs of RAM. And yes, all of this technology has been crammed into a thin and light 15 inch notebook. So yeah, hats off to ASUS here for the job they've done. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens with the 1060 and the 1070 Max-Q parts and just what kind of form factors we see those integrated into. But that's all from me for now. Do like and subscribe. And of course, follow us on Twitter for all the latest Digital Foundry updates. But for now, thanks for watching.